Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. It's an imposing fish, sure to inspire awe in those who see it. At a time when other large fish are rapidly disappearing from the world's oceans, this giant is making a comeback in Florida. It's a unique feeling to be able to get close to a marine animal that's as big as you. This is the Goliath grouper, a fish once almost hunted to extinction. It's like going to a park where you never saw a bear for years and years, and now you see a dozen you know, big grizzly bears. I mean, it's an impressive thing to see. But the Goliath's return is not a welcome sight to all. Both spear fishermen and rod and reel fishermen believe the Goliath grouper is eating everything on the reef and is destroying the ecosystem. But what does the scientific data show? Are Goliaths really overpopulating the reef, or is this species just now beginning to recover? They are an impressive sight, the largest fish on the reef. They can weigh up to a thousand pounds and exceed seven feet in length. Goliath grouper, which used to be known as dewfish, historically were found from as far north as the Carolinas, across the Caribbean, and south to Brazil. The fish can also be found off the west coast of Africa, and a distinct subspecies exists in the Pacific. Today, they are considered critically endangered by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Everywhere except the southeastern United States, they are indeed critically endangered. Of course, they're protected throughout all U.S. possessions, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, as well as southeastern United States. They were on the threatened species list, but they've been since taken off that list because their population in the southeastern United States is on the road to recovery. Goliaths are a shallow water species rarely found at depths below 200 feet. They need water temperatures above 60 degrees Fahrenheit to survive, which limits their range. And for the most part, they are curious but shy creatures. They often retreat to their favorite hideout when humans approach. These are animals that don't move much. They sit, they love wrecks, they love caves, they love any kind of structure that typically has a, an overhead for them. It, it gives them a sense of security, I suppose. Basically, I kind of joke about calling them the couch potatoes of the grouper family. They don't even eat every day. Aside from their tremendous size, Divers and fishermen can easily distinguish goliaths from other grouper species by the brown stripes along the sides of their body and their distinctive rounded tail fin. Recreational fishermen have long enjoyed Florida's waters for the impressive catches they yield, which used to include goliath grouper. Historical photographs show proud anglers posing beside their massive catches, fish larger than themselves. In those days, the resource seemed endless. The wrecks offshore in 100, 150 feet probably had you know, over 100 Jewfish each on them. They were just absolutely packed. Don Di Maria, who used to work as a commercial fisherman, says Goliath grouper are an easy target. He started spearing them commercially in the late 1970s on remote wrecks in the Gulf of Mexico. We catch most of these Jewfish between Key West and Tampa, mostly off the Fort Myers area, seem to be the biggest concentration of them. 
and we bring them back and sell them in Key West. In Key West, it was always a local delicacy among the Kongs. Don and his colleagues discovered that Goliath grouper tend to aggregate around certain wrecks and ledges in the summertime. That's when they aggregated the spawn, which was the ultimate downfall of the fishery, is that they aggregate in these large groups. With the advent of modern-day navigation devices, fishermen could soon locate these aggregation sites easily in the offshore waters of the Gulf. But over the years, more and more people got into it, and it, it didn't take much. Very little extra pressure. And I saw spawning aggregations go from 100 fish down to, one case, just one fish, and other areas, none. One of these wrecks is in California, and this wreck had an unbelievable amount of fish on it, way over 100. And I went there after a charter dive boat, and it was just sickening what we saw. There were fish swimming around with spears in their sides. Others had big hook and line, like rope and chain type rigs where they'd broken off. And it's my understanding they took something like 30 fish back to Marco Island. These fish would average around 200 pounds each. Took their photographs with them and didn't have enough ice for the fish, and they ultimately just got wasted. That was in the late 1980s. Don and his friends decided to take action. Don knew so much about uh, Goliath grouper uh, behavior and populations. It was just amazing and thank God he became a conservationist <laughs> because he could probably have wiped them out by himself. And he actually went to the fishery management councils and said, you've got to stop fishing on this species. Can't take this level of fishing. Uh, it's going to be completely annihilated. When you have a commercial fisherman that comes up to you and says, save this fish, you pay attention to it. And I would say that he single-handedly convinced people. That's not usually the way it happens. It usually uh, takes a long time before that there's scientific evidence that a population's in trouble. There were people locally that grumbled about it, but there was just so few fish left that there just wasn't much opposition. And so in 1990, the Goliath grouper fishery was closed in U.S. waters. Today, the harvest of this species is a second-degree misdemeanor that carries a fine. A few years after the closure, marine ecologist Dr. Felicia Coleman and Dr. Chris Koenig began studying the life history of these giant fish. The husband and wife team who work at the Coastal and Marine Laboratory at Florida State University have conducted a number of studies over the years to gain a better understanding of the species. To collect their data, scientists spend many hours at sea. Chris works closely with local captains and fishermen who often have an intimate knowledge of the sites where the grouper can be found. One of them is Tony Grogan, who operates a popular website for spear fishermen. Tony often volunteers his boat to take scientists into the field. I'm a big advocate of good science and sound fisheries management decisions. In recent years, Goliath grouper have again started to aggregate on wrecks and ledges near Jupiter, Florida, close to where Tony lives. By the 1960s, most of the Goliaths along South Florida's Atlantic coast had been fished out, so it is very encouraging to see the animals return. To collect valuable data about the fish, the grouper need to be brought up to the surface. Usually, Chris sets a hand line to capture the Goliaths. But on this trip, Tony and his friends came up with another idea. We're actually fishing hook and line, long line, underwater, and we're using a lift bag to send the Goliath grouper up. We tie off the lift bag away from the wreck so we can catch them and prevent them from running back into the wreck and very carefully send them up on the lift bag. Down one. Look over there. Good job, 
Yep. Once the fish is on the surface, it needs to be brought up to the boat for a workup. This particular Goliath grouper is relatively small and therefore easier to handle. Chris can tell how old the fish is by removing parts of its dorsal fin ray. That's the so-called soft ray. It lays down rings like the rings of a tree, and so we can estimate age of the fish. Traditionally, fish are aged by looking at the rings found in their ear bones. But since this would require killing the fish, Chris and Felicia discovered that taking a piece of the dorsal fin ray works just as well. We felt like it was very important not to sacrifice those fish. You can remove the rays from the fish and, and they can regrow. You can go back and check on a number of different things like growth rate of individual fish if you can uh, repeatedly uh, capture the same individual. Historically, Goliath grouper can live to be at least 37 years old. But because of the severe fishing pressures in the past, the current population is still relatively young. All of the individuals we've looked at are under 18, which is the time of the fishery closure in 1990. So uh, their population was clearly beat way, way back. Next, it's time to analyze the stomach contents of the fish. This is done by inserting a metal tube into the mouth of the fish and pulling out whatever food may be in the fish's stomach. By and large, they're eating crabs, shrimp, they're eating some lobster, they're eating stingrays and things like that. Now that just gives you a snapshot of what the fish just ate. To really get a comprehensive look at the diet of the fish, scientists need to conduct a chemical analysis of tissue samples. And what you're looking for there is a, a signal or a signature that tells you what the diet's made up. So the studies that we've done on Goliath grouper strongly indicate that these guys eat crustaceans, not fish primarily. Having this kind of data is not only interesting from a scientific standpoint, but it also helps to shed light on a big controversy that has been brewing since the number of Goliaths has gone up again in Florida waters. A lot of the fishermen are under the impression that Goliath grouper are destroying the reefs by focusing on feeding on the other grouper and snapper species, leaving fewer for them to fish. Now, an equally plausible explanation for what they think is happening is that all of the grouper and snapper have basically been fished out. And the reason they're seeing Goliath grouper uh, is because it's a protected species, and so that's what's left on the reef. There's no question that they're opportunistic. If they see a fish going by on a hook or a piece of bait, they'll take it. But, Felicia says, snapper and other grouper species do not seem to be their preferred diet. Once all the scientific data has been collected, and the fish has been tagged, it is time to release it. We're gonna lower it. I'm ready. We've tagged thousands of fish uh, over the last 10 or 12 years, and we find the same fish on the same rock year after year after year. Now that's not to say that the fish don't move. When sex comes into the picture, they'll go 100 miles and participate in spawning events, but they'll come back to the same rock. Scientists aren't sure how these fish know where to join up for these annual aggregations that have been documented in the Gulf of Mexico during the late summer months. In recent years, the fish have also been gathering in the Atlantic, near Jupiter. It is suspected that these might be spawning sites as well. And to test that hypothesis, Tony and the scientists head back out later in the day to study the aggregation sites. But will they be able to gather Goliath grouper eggs, the ultimate proof that spawning is taking place? The information that we've gotten from studies done on sound output by Goliath grouper during spawning indicate that they spawn around a new moon on dark nights, somewhere between midnight and 3 a.m. in the morning. And this is evidence, as I said, but we don't have any real proof that they're doing this, and proof would constitute collecting their fertilized eggs. Chris deploys plankton nets in the water at night in hopes of catching some eggs. 
Meanwhile, his colleague Jim Lacasio, who studies fish acoustics, prepares to deploy a hydrophone in the vicinity of the nets. The dominant sounds tonight in this environment are probably going to be by the Goliath grouper at an expected spawning location. Sounds produced by many species of fish are done so in, in a specific behavioral context. Most often it's associated with courtship and spawning. And in most cases, almost without exception, it's the male that produces the sound, uh, courting, advertising for a female. This is the hydrophone that's connected to the top of the housing. This is just like an underwater microphone. It's going to be recording ambient sounds in a frequency range that is within the, the sounds made by the Goliath grouper, which is quite low, below 100 hertz, about 40 or 50 hertz, uh, very low frequencies. All right, it's on the bottom, Tony. If this location is indeed a spawning site, the dominant sounds recorded should be those of the Goliath grouper. Goliath grouper are famous for the very loud, booming sounds they make, not just to attract potential mates, but also as a defense mechanism to scare off potential predators. They're very deep, resonating booms, and they make them with their swim bladder and muscles that are attached to their swim bladder. They vibrate those muscles at a rapid speed, say 100 times a second, or in that range. The closest thing I can liken it to on land is like a sonic boom. Oftentimes divers are able to feel the sound before they hear it and you feel it in your, in your lungs. It's, it's a concussion from that pressure and so it's quite intimidating as a, as a diver if you aren't aware the fish is around. They do not appear to have uh, a diverse vocabulary, that is the, the sounds that are produced uh, when you know, divers approach them also seem to be the same sounds that they produce uh, with and amongst each other. Now, it's time to sit and wait. Early the next morning, Just keep pulling. Chris and Jim retrieve the nets and hydrophone. Once ashore, the nets are washed down and their contents put through a sieve. It's fairly easy to separate the eggs from other plankton. And then, because of their stage of development and their size, we should be able to select Goliath grouper eggs from whatever else we catch. Because they should be in very early stages of development when we pull our nets. While Chris is taking a close look at the plankton under the microscope, Jim analyzes the sound he recorded on location. We recorded a lot of low frequency pulsed sounds that you can see as the brighter signals along the bottom of the picture here of the spectrogram. And most of this energy is uh, at, a, at 100 hertz or below 100 hertz. So there's a series of individual calls that we can zoom in on and, and look closely at and identify the, the fish uh, as a Goliath grouper. Jim's sound recordings indicate that the scientists documented a spawning aggregation. But the ultimate proof is in the eggs, thousands of which Chris collected in his nets. Later DNA tests of these eggs confirmed what scientists were hoping for, that Goliath grouper are spawning again on Florida's east coast. Once the fertilized eggs hatch, the larvae will float in the plankton for about a month and a half. They hatch out uh, probably in a day and a half. But when they hatch out, they don't have any mouths and they don't have any eyes. So they're simply floating around, still living off their yolk material. And um, over the next week or so, they develop a mouth and eyes and, be, and learn how to feed. And then there's uh, the growth period. And by the time they settle, they're about three quarters of an inch in length. They undergo this metamorphosis that takes about a week. And then they're little groupers and they live in the mangrove leaf litter in the earliest stages and then move to the undercuts in the mangrove habitat. The fish will spend their juvenile years in the mangrove forest using the mangrove's prop roots as protective cover from potential predators. North America's largest remaining mangrove forest is in the 10,000 Islands area of southwest Florida, the main stronghold for juvenile Goliath grouper. 
We lost 28% of the mangroves in the 10,000 Islands area, just between the mid-80s and the mid-90s. That's a significant loss, considering it went on since the beginning of the 1900s for mosquito abatement, for agriculture, for just development of all of South Florida. The East Coast essentially has no mangroves of consequence anymore. So there's a tight connection between the habitat availability and the success of this species. And it's not just availability of juvenile habitat that matters, but the quality of that habitat is important as well. Water quality for Goliath grouper, like most species, is important. It's particularly an issue in the juvenile habitat. We looked at them in a really pristine area in the 10,000 Islands, which is just incredible. But there are a number of rivers and canals that lead into that body of water. For one reason or another, the water quality is very poor. And what happens in those areas is that the density of Goliath grouper is uh, not very high. So if you think about how you want to go about protecting a species like Goliath grouper, it takes more than closing down the fishery. You need to protect the quality of the water, the extent of the habitat, and keep fishing at a minimum. Goliath grouper are easy to exploit. They aren't difficult to catch, and they can be found in large groups during the summer aggregations. They're relatively slow to mature. They're staying in the mangroves for five or six years. And when they first go offshore, uh, they're not necessarily mature at that time. And yet you're talking about an, an animal that's 50, 60, 70 pounds, and it's still a juvenile. They become sexually mature at about four feet in length, and so they become sexually mature as a function of size rather than age. While some grouper species change sex during their lifetime, Chris and Felicia say no such evidence exists for the Goliath grouper. Scientists and many others are excited that the Goliath grouper population is on the road to recovery. Walt Stearns is a professional photographer who also publishes an online magazine called Underwater Journal. His career has taken him to underwater locations all over the world, and he is delighted to see the fish make such a steady comeback in Florida. At the same time, I was working for dive magazines covering the Central and Southern Caribbean and the Bahamas, and I'm watching the all grouper populations just diminish. Each time I went back, I've seen less of them, seeing smaller fish, and here where I'm seeing the Goliath grouper come back, and this is really incredible to see protection work. Unfortunately, not everyone shares his view. Some fishermen not only claim the grouper are eating all their game fish, but they also accuse the species of being aggressive towards them. I've never had any of them get aggressive, but you know, some people will sit there and give these stories, and it's like, it came out and grabbed me, and grabbed my arm and shook me like a rag doll. I was like, really? I've never had that happen yet. I mean, they're big enough and strong enough where they physically can really hurt you, but for the most part, they're big babies. On his website, spearboard.com, Tony hears from folks on all sides of the issue. The internet is a big, wild and woolly place, and there are opinions all over. What I try to do is just take the middle road and ask questions about do we know enough to make an intelligent decision about any kind of fishery management decision. Both scientists Felicia and Chris agree that while the grouper's recovery is encouraging, it is too early to reopen the fishery. When you've got a species that's critically endangered throughout its range, and you have one area where it's recovering, that being the southeastern United States, it doesn't make sense to open a fishery again, even at reduced levels when we really don't understand what the population's doing yet. I think until the entire population is recovered throughout its former range, there should be no harvest of Goliath grouper. Below the water's surface, the Goliath grouper is oblivious to the controversy it has stirred up on land. It goes about its business like its ancestors have done for ages. 
Most people who have had the privilege of seeing these fish up close, especially in large numbers, agree that they are an awesome sight to behold. One that will hopefully be around for many future generations to enjoy. It's hard to think of anybody who couldn't be fascinated by them. They're fabulous fish, and they're a key feature of the ecology of this part of the world. I think it's one of those animals that's worth a lot more alive than dead. I mean, people can go out to the reef or these wrecks and see these fish over and over again, take pictures of it. And it's just, um, you kill it one time and it's over with, and that's it. The fish that took 30 or 50 years to get to that size. And I just think it's something that's unique to South Florida. There's nowhere else in the world where you can go where it's documented and see these large aggregations of big groupers like this. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources.